in episode five of the Sigma Empath podcast, we're going to talk about the power of the heart's electromagnetic field in regards to healing and regulation of the nervous system. We're also going to talk about the contentious topic of unaliving or suicide and overall recovery from trauma. Hi, I'm Holly Davis and I'm a counselor. Tell us a bit more. Counseling can mean a lot of things. What exactly do you have specific genres that you focus on predominantly? Yes, I think one of my specializations is it's drugs and alcohol recovery. I think the other thing is simply being with people. So it's no matter what they're going through. So it could be depression, it could be anxiety, it could be something's changing in their life, something they want to change in their life, people going through adjustments. So uh, counselor, it's a clinical counselor. So a licensed clinical counselor, What's licensed clinical between, professional counselor. What's the difference between a regular counselor and a clinical counselor? That, that's a good question. I believe I'm a counselor by nature. That's my gift. I feel like that's something I was born with. You might be born with a gift of counseling. It depends on your degree. For mine, mine is mental health counseling. There are some people that are licensed social workers. Um, and then you have psychiatrists. Those are the people who deal with medications. So counseling is, uh, that's what I would prefer to be called as a counselor. But that is also what I what I did before I had my degree. That's my gift. So I like the word counseling because it doesn't push people away. It doesn't sound so... I don't know, clinical, like even the word mental health, Vital, I don't, I don't really like that word because it implies something's wrong with you. So that's why I like counseling. I totally agree. Um, is there a difference between, because we do talk a lot about mental health and to your point, it suggests that there's something wrong with you. I also like to bring in the element of there's our emotional wellness, not emotional health. How would you phrase or how do you phrase mental health in a way that is more welcoming, softer, less degrading, less traumatic, less tabooed? Yes, I I, I love where you're going with that because the word psychology is healing the soul. Now, again, I don't want to push people away with that either because I don't want to make it woo-woo, but that's the original in the Greek, you know? So I... I, I I love that. I like to think of it like this. One hour with your therapist is uh, it's like a spa for the soul. It's your inner being. It's not just this stuff out here, which we draw a lot of attention to in the world. It's this stuff here that nobody else understands and nobody else knows. And, a, you know, your therapist or your counselor has the flashlight so that you can go through a dark place. So I like to think of it as if we invest in our physical well-being, we like to be healthy, mental health. My belief, it has to be number one, mental health first. So it's well-being, and that could take so many different perspectives. Your mental, physical, social, and spiritual well-being. And spiritual could be whatever you feel brings you peace and wholeness. I love that. I want to tap in all the words you've said. You talked about psychology meaning therapy or soothing of the soul, healing of the soul. Beautiful yeah. and profound. We've talked mental health. Do all these challenges, emotional, spiritual, intellectual, relationship, is it all based on trauma? Is it that simple? Somebody experiences trauma and they go down a path. Is it that simple? I, I wish that's the billion dollar question, right? That's the, the question of life is why do I act the way I do? Epistemology is why do I do what I do? Many of it is, it could be just our structural being. It could just be my essence, who I am. It could be wonderful things that I've inherited. Thanks. Yeah. It could be where I was brought up. It could be just because I'm a redhead. It could be a million different things. I tend to work a lot with people who sit in a chair and they there's always mom, dad, relationship issues. And then I would have to say, Vital, most people, it's themselves. My biggest work, the best medicine that I can give them is them learning themselves to thine own self be true. And if they can figure themselves out, then if I never even saw them again, I, I would never worry about them because they've got to start listening to the inner being. And most people have a beef with themselves. They're so I hard on themselves. I want to connect that to trauma and in terms of identity, a beautiful, powerful topic. We have the 
narcissist and then we have maybe on the opposite side of the spectrum we'll say the empath i think empaths i promote being a conscious empath i'm wearing a t-shirt now being a conscious empath it's all about knowing thyself to your point when it comes to the narcissist can a narcissist know thyself is that possible because for me my understanding of narcissism a lot of it is denial grandiosity bravado they cannot identify or self-evaluate those are really great points. My guttural and my first instinct and what I think about narcissism, people who uh, highly regard themselves or over regard themselves or um, think more highly of themselves as they ought is a show. It's a front because really at the crux of that, at the root of that is someone who really beats themselves up. And it's so much more you know, easy to be angry and push other people away and use my energy to usurp yours and make you little. So narcissism to me are people who are in the most, I would say, resistance. They, they're they resisting. They're in so much resistance because they don't, they want to deflect from themselves and make themselves bigger because at the very root is someone who's very, very hurt. So the word narcissist or somebody who comes in, in the form of a narcissist, I, I see through it. Oh, tell me more about that. You see through it because I think this is an important topic because on the surface, we just see, we, yes, we know they're wounded. We know they're hurt and we know all the, the common traits, but you're saying you see through it. So what do you see that the average person doesn't see? What should a person understand about a narcissist? Because for me, I meet a narcissist and the door shuts and I run away. And it's kind of the message for self-protection for other people, but you're seeing deeper. What are you seeing that we're missing? You know, that gives me goosebumps because I think sometimes I can't unsee things, you know, like I can't unsee somebody crying or somebody who's got the bravado that's that's really deep down hurting. And, and I think that's because I, I believe all of us have this mask on and, and really I, I like to see underneath it because I think people are inherently incredibly beautiful. And the ones that I see with the most sour face or the most big energy that they're puffing up, of course, my ego and just Holly might want to diffuse and deflect and go and, and make that go away. And I don't want to see it. But the truth is they're doing that for a reason. Their, their essence is has to exude something for self-protection. There's so. not one of us on this planet that doesn't have some self-protection. So that's just what their character, their essence is doing at the time. But what I love is to really get past all that to the true human. And when we get to that true human and they see that true human and they see their value, I see value in all humanity, in all humans, in all humans. I find very few that just disgust me. And even those they're riveting to me. They're riveting to me, Vital. I, I love it. I almost want to dig deeper. So I, because I'm just so interested in people, I'm 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 a researcher of people, and that's what I do in my spare time is research people because I really am extremely interested. So with with a narcissist, I would want to ask him a million questions. Why? What's well, going on? I've, Why I've, are you? I've tried. You're obviously doing something different that's working for you, and I I love that. You talked about the word resistance. You said you didn't want to get woo-woo, but let's go get, Let's go there a little bit because I understand the word resistance in some capacity, but on a spiritual level, can you tell us more what you meant by people resisting and that, and that's part of the, the pain and maybe the trauma, the trauma that they're experiencing. Tell us about this resistance thing. Being open as a human and, and taking the mask down is, is very frightening. And especially if you're not doing it with yourself. And I find the deepest illnesses are the ones that lie to themselves. You know, you can't lie to yourself in your inner being. But once you do it so much, it just can't hear it anymore. And so I, I think with the resistances, we're just knuckle gripping and the jaws clenching life. And I know because I do it all day myself. And I every all day I'm like this, shoulders down, yeah. breathe. Even on my worst day, the roller coaster and the and the gritty life is a, is a great day, and the resistance is go away, go away. I would say mostly even going back to the narcissist is I want you guys to go away, but the truth is we really want you to come here, come here, come here. So resistance is it's difficult for us to open our hearts. You know, in yoga we hate this. Anything like this, we want to be like this. 
Yes. yes. Stands with fists. That you remember stands with fists. We don't we don't want anybody in. And mostly it's not a personal front on anyone. It's they don't want to hear themselves. We beat ourselves up. We are our worst saboteur than than anyone. Especially here's the one phenomenon that makes me the most baffled. Someone treats me bad, so I'm gonna treat me bad. I've been abused, so I feel like I deserve abuse, and especially for myself. So if we can start with that resistance, when I see it, I get really excited in a client. The ones that are swatting me the most, because I feel like those are the ones that are crying out for help the most. So mm -hmm. resistance is a good thing. It can be definitely a good thing. I mean, if you talk about muscle tension, we build muscle, we build resilience by a sense of resistance in our life that we overcome. In your bio, you, you phrased... You work with Las Vegas's most vulnerable, but I'm going to go on a broader scale. Let's just take it on a, on a global scale. You work with society's most vulnerable. Who are those people? Mm. And I think when I was writing that too, I, I'm talking about in Las Vegas as a counselor, I, I'm sure you can imagine the things that I've seen and heard. I've been here 30 years. I know exactly what you mean. Um, some of the populations are incredible but i think the thing about mental health is that it's always had a stigma it's always been shunned the the madman has always been put out to the edge of town or up in the highest heights and i have a heart for people who have mental mental let's say symptoms of mental health because that's not who they are i i hate diagnoses i hate the Hi, I have bipolar. I can't stand that because that's not who you are. It's symptoms that you experience. Ooh, I love that. So you're basically saying, and this is a part, I think, of uh, a downfall of society is that we identify with the label we've been given and we take ownership as if that defines who I am. And you're saying it's actually the opposite. You might have bipolar, a bipolar disorder, but that doesn't mean that's who you are. There's so much. Is that what you're saying? Right, right, exactly. And and diagnosis for insurance and doctors and, you know, the field, it, it's really just so we can identify some of the symptoms. So you're not your symptoms. You're not your symptoms. So I I, I think when, when we, we talk about mental health, there's not one person on this planet that doesn't experience some sort of symptom. And if they do, it's off and on. But to own it and say, I'm going to wear this all the time. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite clients, he had the worst depression I've seen. And I've you know, I'm not saying I've seen it all. I think the more I know, the more I don't know about psychology and people because everyone is individual. He was really, really bad. He was he was sitting in the desert and was going to kill himself. And he he called, he got therapy and he totally changed. He, he had a metamorphosis because he understood his strength and he understood who he was. But him and depression had this major fight. He was fighting with it. And so he, he called his depression Frank, named it. Okay. And so I said, well, how's Frank been? He goes, oh, he came back again. I was going to punch him in the face. I go, wait, 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 wait. What, what did Frank have to say? And he said, you know, he's looking at all these other people who have, you know, a, a date and a girlfriend and, and they're happy. And I go, well, maybe Frank's telling you that you're lonely and that you long for connection. You want to be seen. So I, we don't need to fight and swat at the the symptoms depression is there for a reason it's telling you something anxiety is there for a reason it's telling you something i have a lot of clients who um, have a disability it's not who they are they're not disabled we call it the d word and a wheelchair and they just want to you know they're so angry because they can't do things and so i had one client with his wheelchair and i said well do you want to kick its butt you want me to kick its butt for it we can also look at that this wheelchair is getting you to the places that you need to go. So sometimes we look at our our weaknesses in disdain and they're disgusting to us. But I see them as these are the things that were brought here for whatever reason that we need to overcome. And once we do, the most incredible things happen is you don't care about the that. That's not the emphasis anymore. It's but what can I do? Isn't that challenging for somebody who is in the wheelchair who you're not in a wheelchair. I'm not in a wheelchair. So we don't fully understand the trauma, the experience that they're having. And so I, I think I understand what you're trying to do, uplift people. I do the same thing. But sometimes it can, and, and this is a part of therapy. It's it's a very delicate dance. And I want to uplift you. I don't want to promote the victim mindset, but 
I'm trying to meet you where you're at. It's it's yes. very hard. It's precarious, Vital, because I tell you, when you get through the highest height, you know that you've had to go through the lowest low. So I let them know right away. Usually when we have to go to those dark places, I would say, I love you, but can I show you something that you may not see? So we go to those darkest places. I mean, we go there. That's why I think people who have a mental health symptom that they're suffering from and they come in and they get help to me are the most brave people on the planet. They're my heroes because I'm not just puffing them up and I'm not just, oh, you can do it. No, it's much more deep than that. It's we go to the depths together and I'm holding the flashlight. I don't fix them. I don't do any of that, but I'm willing to sit and listen and hear how bad it is. And we go there. And what did you feel? And we don't have to go into detail. We don't have to go through all of the pain. But what I do say is I want you to understand and you to validate and you to see how much you went through. And then when you see it, you can congratulate yourself for overcoming. So you're a therapist. You're, you've, you've learned strategies. You're qualified. You're educated. You're informed. The average person in a relationship with somebody dealing with mental health issues, emotional health challenges, addiction. What can those average people do? to be supportive, to be understanding, to be less judgmental. What's the, there's no easy fix, I understand. But what's an easy tip you can tell somebody who is passively experiencing mental health? That's a that's a really great perspective is what, what can we do? And I think it goes back to me for my gift is listening. You know, if you're the person, remember we talk about the open heart and you're walking around, people know it and they can see it a mile away. So the person in front of you in the line at the grocery store is going to turn around and tell you their life story and they're going to know that you're a safe person. So when we have our family members, we're so hard on them because we want, we love them so much and we want them to be well, we want them to be good. And so I think the thing is, judgment, I think is going to be there. You can't not judge but if you can see, again, if you can see past and you can look at the person you know that they are and never, ever, ever give up on that, never, ever give up on that. Just to be vulnerable, um, I have a nephew. He's he's uh, 20, he's 25. This is, is Georgie, that, my therapy is that, dog. Is that, nephew? is that your nephew right there? Yeah, no, no, I'm not, this is my therapy dog. He's the best therapy dog ever. Um and he always comes when when I'm, you know, when and someone needs him. But my nephew, he has been in and out of treatment centers since he was 14. Sober yeah. one year now. And I'm I I'm so proud of him. And he I would pick him up, Vital, in 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 a, a paper suit from jail or um from the hospital, and his face would be busted. And I took him to treatment center after treatment center. I couldn't help him. I couldn't help him. And what I had to do is I'd have to make boundaries because I'm not going to watch you destruct because that's too painful for me. But I would always tell him and I would tell him and I would tell him and I'm tell him like I told him, you are a loved human being. When you're out there on the streets, just remember there's somebody that loves you. But what about those people who don't? I mean, I, I, I've been in those moments where I felt nobody loved me. There are people out there, unfortunately, who are so lonely, who have literally no body. Maybe all they have is is a beautiful dog. You know, that's that's kind of sometimes the thing that we overlook in society is that there are unfortunately those people. But related to dogs, you bring up you bring the dog, and it's perfect segue. As a as a healing modality, we have therapy dogs. You take it one step further. You do uh, is it equine equine therapy? Equine therapy and and mine's really interactive therapy because I'm not an equine therapist. I'm I'm just the regular. You have a beautiful horse and you, and you leverage that horse as a part of your healing for others. Is that is that correct? Right. I bought her during COVID because I just needed to get out of the house and just brush her hair and didn't realize that a horse is a lot, a lot, a lot of a responsibility. But the main thing is I wanted to share her because when I came back, I didn't feel any stress. You know, you just feel like a rag after you've been out away from Las Vegas with this beautiful creature because animals are so healing. And well, and yes, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the horse in terms of I, I subscribe to the Heart Math Institute and their theory of the power of the heart, how it emits um, electromagnetic field around us. The horse's heart is double the size plus of, of, of a human. And they're the micro, the 
electromagnetic uh, frequency of the horse is so large and so powerful, when we're by a horse, we actually align with it and it soothes us. And so I didn't, I don't know if you knew that, but all I can say is I remember meeting your horse, Sugar, a beautiful horse, and I remember being in its presence and I felt a sense of calm. On a deeper level, what does the horse therapy really do to people? Like, is it a question of their, their it regulates their nervous? I mean, what does it actually do? You, you know, that's the beauty of it is it is an enigma. If we really knew, why would this huge thousand pound creature let me put a halter on her and trust me to take care of her? Why? That is the fascination. When I see people combing her and hugging her and loving her and just grooming her that may have a hard time going to get their mail or have such incredible social anxiety and feel like no one else loves them. And when they get close to her and she lets them in her pres her glorious presence, it is to me, nothing short of a miracle. The yeah. fact that she lets me hang out with her to me, it's just a miracle. So that's why I love inviting people just to see for themselves, because I think we could talk it away and you could still never really get the full depth of how amazing it is. Just like with your animal, you know, can you talk to your animals um, without even saying a word and they just, they do I something for this thing. I think dogs and horses more than anything are actually very empathic creatures, very empathic creatures. They sense mood, they sense pain, they sense fear, all these things, and, and that's the value that they bring. Um, last question, and we go through journeys. As, as a therapist, as a child, I grew up in, in the English foster care system. I hated psychologists and I hated therapists because my take was you read a book and you are telling me what you think I should do, what my life means according to your strategy, your statistics, et cetera, et cetera. You've expressed you genuinely care. People have gravitated to you to share their stories. What experiences, if you're willing to share, what, what traumatic experiences have you had that pushed you to really pursue this thing where I've got this natural gift, but I can turn this into a true sense of purpose that brings value to people? I think what happened was I grew up in an, a very abusive home and I had my little proverbial pen and paper. I'm never going to do that. Well, I'll never act like that. And then I grew up and I went into an abusive home myself. I created it. Ooh, I'm like, wow. Tell me more. You created it. Wow. I, I walked in. I created the same abusive home for my children and in and, and a, and a marriage. And I was like, well, how did that happen? I always said I wasn't going to do it, but we don't know how to do anything different unless we unlearn and learn something new. So I started taking parenting classes. I started wanting to be better. I wanted to start, why did I do that? The epistemology was, why did I do that? And so when I started um, studying uh, and also noticing, because I've always been a people person and involved in, in health and human services and volunteering and, and working in parachurch organizations and things like that, I, I, I decided, well, you know, if I'm going to be working with people like this so closely because people let me in, I want to get my degree and my license so I make sure I don't mess anybody up for one. And hey, why not get paid? Why not get paid to talk people off the ledge? Because I do it all day anyway. So I wanted to, one, I wanted to get away from that and I did not want to pass it on to my children. And the thing is, if you don't take care of that, there's no way that you can't pass it on. It doesn't just dissolve if you run from it and go away from it. And going back to the people in the Fremont Street or people who feel like they're very unloved, it's a very big world. And there's homeless people everywhere I've ever been on the planet. There, And I haven't been to a lot of places, but the places I have traveled, there's people asking for help. Not being a Pollyanna, not... When I know people in the helping fields, they would... It's what they live for to help people. It's what they live for. When you ask, I believe people will show up when you ask for help. Worst problem in human society in the pro in the world. No one likes to ask for help. Do you like to ask for help, Vitel? Well, I think part of the reason, and this is this is a, 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 another topic, but I'm, I, I want to quickly go there. I think the average person, most people don't ask for help because the world shames people who are viewed as vulnerable. I promote vulnerability as a strength, not a weakness. 
And, and, and I want to go even deeper because the people who are the most afraid to ask for help are the people who often attempt suicide. For me, this is an important talking point because you brought up something that people don't ask for help because again, we are shamed, we are guilted. We have got to show up and be positive. The world is all positive. Now look at me on social media, how great my life is. And everybody is going back to something you said. Everybody's wearing this mask of perfection and happiness. And then so the person who is not those things, what's wrong with me? Well, I'd like to set whoever that person is who may be listening, you know, today free. It's until you're willing to go through the 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 most excruciating vulnerability that you will get help. And there have been so many people on this planet, it hurts so bad that maybe their want to didn't want to and they couldn't. And, and maybe they completed suicide. And when I see that, I just go through the understanding like that it must have been really, really bad. And so what we can do is every time you see somebody on the streets, maybe you don't have to give them money, but acknowledge them as a human. Every time you're on the phone with somebody who's telling you what they want you to do and you can just acknowledge them as a human. Every time we see somebody, you, you know, know that that's someone's kid. That's someone, somebody loved that kid somewhere, somehow, someday. Maybe they didn't, but maybe I could be the person. And I really, truly live that. I, I'm not trying to sit up here and be somebody that I'm not because I'm I'm pretty authentic person. Because some days there's days that I cut people off and I hang up on the people. On the t I'm a human because humans rub me the wrong way too. I mean, but I think if we think about the world being you know, an ugly, vast spinning, you know, ball that we're going to have to knuckle grip it or that open heart where what a wonderful world. And it takes vulnerability and opening yourself up to the things that really are ugly and really disgusting or make you feel bad and, and look at them and see them and myself and others. We can't just pretend it's not there. It's there. No, but society doesn't do that. And to your point, there is a Zulu tribe and they have an expression which literally sums up what you said. The expression is saubona, and it means I see you. And that's fundamentally what every human being wants. And I firmly believe to your point, if people expressed and showed, I see you, I acknowledge you, the world would be less traumatized, would be happier, we'd have more connection. And I could go down my romantic path of the utopian world, but I, I'm, I'm completely on board. Holly, where can people find you? Yes. Hold on, though. I want to just add one thing to what you said. Sure. If if we could see each other, right? If we, and and I want to add one more thing is if you could see you, and Ooh, really see you. Oh yes, yes. More people will see yeah. you. Yes. More people will love you. More people see you when you start looking at you, and that's okay. what we work on most time in in therapy. Is let's just keep looking at you. Let's don't look at them. Let's look at you, and then more people that you want to see you, or that you want to see. You can look at hollydaviscounseling.com, hollydaviscounseling.com. Yeah, I'll put it um, on. What's your IG handle? If anybody's interested to learn more about Holly services, please uh, read the captions. Holly, it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor. Thank you for sharing your insights. Thank you for the work that you do. Keep saving people who need help. Keep seeing, seeing people. Thank you. You too. Thank you.